This is Mid-Atlantic Women in Agriculture's Wednesday webinar, Soil pH, Liming Rates, and Fertility. Our presenter today is Dr. Jared Miller, Extension Educator at University of Maryland. All materials discussed during the presentation can be found at our website. And a special thank you to our sponsors, Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit, Delaware Department of Agriculture, and Maryland Department of Agriculture. Thank you so much and enjoy listening to our presentation. All right, all right, I got it. Okay, I'll test slides real quick. Looks good. Okay, thanks everybody um, for attending. I'll go ahead and get started. Let me know if you can't hear me very well. I've done this uh, talk before with Nutrient Management and they have a little trouble with this month, but just let me know if you need me to adjust anything. So I'm gonna talk about soil pH and lime rate. First off, you want to start off with understanding what are the benefits of lime. Number one, we add it to soil to neutralize acidity. As a side product, it helps reduce the toxicity of some elements like aluminum and manganese. It can add calcium and magnesium depending on what your lime source is. And it can also improve the soil biology as well as pesticide efficacy. So soil uh, microbes, just like plants, they're going to prefer a certain pH range and they're involved in nutrient cycling and breakdown of organic matter so if you can maintain a good pH for them that also benefits crop production. You need to understand what pH is in case you've forgotten about it since chemistry course. Uh, pure water is H2O. If you were to split it up you would have H and OH and H is the acid and OH is the base. Any addition of H such as if you were to add hydrochloric acid to something, you would make it more acidic. If you add something like sodium hydroxide, which adds the OH, you would make something more basic or alkaline. So pH is a measure of the concentration of hydrogen. So that P means concentration of acid. You just need to understand that when you go, when you increase in pH, is down here at the bottom of this graph. As you go from 4 to 10, you're decreasing in your hydrogen concentration. So as your pH goes up, you get more alkaline or basic and less acidic. And you can see right here at a pH of 7, you have equal concentrations of the acid and the base, so that's why we call it neutral. As you drop in pH, you increase in your acid concentration. But what's important to know is when you go from a pH of 7 to 6, that's a 10 times change because that P is a negative log. So when you go from a pH of 7 to 6, you have 10 times more acidity than you did before, even though those numbers are really tiny. So in soils, what causes acidity? Well, hydrogen is the acid. That's what we consider to be acidity. But there are elements like aluminum that can actually split water when they're free and create acidity. So when you look at a soil test report, you might see a discussion or a list of aluminum as an acid. It itself isn't acidic, but it creates acidity in your soil. So soils that have a high amount of aluminum, typically soils higher in clay, um, older red looking soils, can have more acidity than other soils. The elements calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium down here, all of these, we call them the base cation and they'll be listed as bases on your soil test report because they don't split water. Because they don't create acidity, they're bases. It's good to compare soil pH to everyday things in your life that you might know. So you come over here, a pH of 5 to 7 in this range, humid region arable soils, that means where we live, um, in Maryland, soils that we can grow things on usually sit between about 5 to 7 in their pH. So soils are naturally slightly acidic. If you look at, if you were to have limestone or you were out in the desert, you'd see you have soils with a slightly higher pH as you build up in calcium, and that's similar to baking soda or an acid the tablets. If you had um, acid rain, you might have soils that sit down here in this pH, or acid sulfate soils from mine drainage.
But you can see that natural rain actually has a pH that's less than 7. Pure water is 7, but rain has carbon dioxide in it. And the carbon dioxide dissolves into the rainwater and creates a carbonate and then um, additional acidic acid, carbonic acid. So natural rain actually does have a low pH. So it's not unusual if you were to measure the pH of rain, it doesn't mean you have acid rainfall if your pH is 5, 6. That's natural. But you can imagine if these soils in our region are being washed by slightly acidic rainfall, then our soils should be, over time, slightly acidic. So what causes these soils to be acidic? It's mainly uh, due to weathering. Minerals break down and release aluminum over time, so that increases acidity. So that red soil on the left represents where we are in this warm, wet climate, where a lot of rainfall, and that slightly acidic rainfall, slowly leaches out any base cations. Calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium aren't held on the soil as strong as aluminum. So over time, when you have a lot of rainfall and it's slightly acidic, it's going to wash out all of these bases and leave behind aluminum. So if we don't add these back in in the form of lime, or they're not maintained in some kind of cycle like a forest system, then slowly these soils will acidify. Now if you were to go out to a desert area where we have more evaporation than rainfall, you can actually get salts that accumulate at the surface, and these soils will be higher in pH because the rain isn't washing out the bases but actually leaves them behind in the soil. So because the eastern part of the United States gets a lot more rainfall, we'd expect our soils to be older and more leached. If you look at this map of the United States and you look at these soil types, there are 12 different soil types that we recognize, but right here this orange one is ultisols, which means ultimate weathering. These are very highly weathered soils on the east coast, and it matches very closely with our rainfall. And if you go out to the desert regions, the drier regions of the United United States, you can see we have aridosols or desert soils. So we're going to have more acidic soils in this part of the country, and you're going to have less acidic soils as you drop in rainfall and you go across the United States. But what's interesting is if you notice, right in here we have alpha sols, which are higher base soils, and you can see that it doesn't necessarily follow rainfall everywhere. That's because parent material also controls what the soil weathers out. So if you were to go across Maryland and look at all the different rock types we have, that soils can form out of, if you were to start out in the mountains, you can actually have sandstones and shales here, but you can also have regions where you might be forming in a limestone and you get these calcium carbonate coverings on the soil. So soils in this region, if they're forming out of limestone, can actually have a naturally higher pH. If you go to the center of the state, where we have soils that form from bedrock, this bedrock, these soils can be leached and they can be acidic, but as this bedrock weathers, it can actually add nutrients back to the soil. Versus the coastal plain, where a lot of the sands and clays that are on the coastal plain washed off of this region and from up north, so they're very weathered. A lot of the nutrients would have washed out to sea and just left behind the soils, and they don't hold a lot of nutrients. So our soils can be uh, naturally more acidic and have uh, lower uh, base saturation than some of the soils in the rest of the state. So it's not only the rainfall, rainfall makes a difference nationwide, but once you get into this region, you also have to consider what did my soil form out of. So why do soil test reports have two pHs? More than likely, you've probably ignored it if you didn't understand what buffer pH was. But you can have two pHs on a soil test report. The first one, pH, this one actually measures the active acidity in the soil water. This is the most important one for crop production. This pH right here tells you what your crop sees, what your soil sees, and what your biology sees. So this is telling you whether or not you want to raise it. So if you want your pH to be 6.5, then this pH is too low. This buffer pH doesn't tell you what the acidity is at present. It tells you acidity that's held back on the soil. So when we want to lime a soil and raise this to 6.5, we have to measure what we're going to talk about as buffer capacity, is how much additional acidity is held in reserve. Because when we measure that regular pH, we basically take a soil particle, 
and we mix it with water and then we measure all, we stick a probe into it and we measure all the hydrogen, all the acidity that's in that soil water and that tells us that's what all the crop sees and that's what the microbes see. But if you were to lime this to try to get rid of all this acidity, if your soil has a high CEC, there's additional acidity that you don't see that's absorbed to the soil and as you add lime to get rid of this acidity, the acidity on the soil can come off and replace it. So having a high CEC is great for holding nutrients, but that also means it can hold acids. So we have to read a buffer pH to figure out what is the buffer on this soil, how much additional acidity is held back. So when we lime, we also lime to take care of any acidity on here that we want to get rid of. So CEC is great for explaining reserve acidity. If you don't know what CEC is, cation exchange capacity. The cations are all these nutrients. Calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium are all positively charged, so they're called cations, but so are hydrogen and aluminum. The exchange is their ability to come on and off the soil, and the capacity is how much can that soil hold. Not, not all soils have the same ability to hold nutrients. Buffer pH is a measurement that we use to determine lime rate, but the buffer capacity is actually related to CEC. So when people talk about buffer capacity, they're really talking about how much can your soil hold, how many additional nutrients, how many additional acids are sitting on your soil. So soils with a higher CEC have a greater buffer capacity. The great thing about buffer capacity, it's going to slow rapid pH change up or down. So that's really great for soil biology. The more well buffered your soil is, you know the pH is going to change quickly. So your crops and your microbes won't go into shock if all of a sudden tomorrow you put out some lime and that pH jumped up to 8. But it also means that your soil is going to require more lime. So when I tell people that their soil might have a high buffer capacity, they're thinking about the cost of lime, but the good news is on that end, your soil will acidify much slower as well. Base saturation is a term that refers to how many bases are on your CEC. So the soil on the left at a 50% base saturation Essentially, half the sites are held up by bases and the other half are held up by acids. If you increase it to 75%, then, then that means 75% of the sites on your soil are held by bases and the other 25% is acids. It's a good thing to remember, and what we're going to discuss about liming your soil, is you don't want to get rid of all this acidity. Because when you raise your pH too high, that can have other effects on your soil that aren't good for crops. If you have a soil that has a very high CEC and you add the same amount of lime to each one, your soil that had a higher CEC here over on the left and had a higher cation exchange capacity, if you were to add the same amount of lime to each of these soils, you would still have some acidity left. You add it to a sandy soil, you can quickly overlime your soil. So that's why it's good to understand what is your buffer capacity, how large is your CEC, are you a clay soil versus a sandy soil, you don't want to add the same amount of lime to different soil types for a reason to make sure that you are making sure you have micronutrients available and you don't raise the pH too rapidly. So a variation in CEC can also occur with pH and this is only important in a concept because sometimes people see their CEC change with liming and they think that they're changing something in the soil when actually all that really happens to go over this quickly is that if you have a lot of organic matter, because of the properties of that, as you increase pH, you can actually increase the CEC of your soil. So you can imagine that there, the reason buffer capacity becomes hard to measure is because if your soil can increase in its CEC with pH, it's increasing the buffer capacity. So as we lime these soils, we have to consider how much additional acidity is there, as well as is the CEC going to change in that soil? But really it only happens in soils that have a whole lot of organic matter, so you don't have to worry about it most of the time. Buffer capacity, if you were to talk to a soil scientist, they would also want to talk about how soils are buffered at carbonates at high pHs and aluminum at low pHs. But in agriculture, we don't have to worry about that. It's great for soil scientists to talk about 
but most of our soils are going to sit between these red lines, between 5 and 7, and our soils are buffered by CEC. So if you understand the CEC of your soil, then you understand how well buffered it is. So buffer pH is measured a little different than the regular pH. They take a soil sample and they mix it into a solution that has a high pH, like a pH of 8. And all this acidity that's on the soil will come off and lower the pH of the soil. So say over 24 hours, this pH drops from 8 to 7.9. You know you don't have a lot of buffer capacity on your soil. You don't have a lot of additional acidity. But if this pH were to drop to 5.5, you would know that not only is, would your soil have been acidic, but that you have to add more lime to get rid of the acidity that's held on this soil. So the buffer pH is measured in an alkaline solution versus a regular pH, which is just measured in water. The reason it's important to understand all these tests in buffer pH is because across the country, we have so many different soils, so many different soil types, that we've had to come up with different way ways to measure buffer capacity. So this is um, an example from 1996, which has changed for some states. You can see for Maryland is listed as other, and we actually don't have a soil testing lab anymore. But Maryland included soil texture in their measurements. But the SMP buffer is pretty popular. SMP is currently done by AgriLab in Delaware. Adams Evans is done by the University of Delaware. This Malik test is done in North Carolina and was done up in the north for a little while. The SMP is pretty popular across the country, and the reason it's important to know these tests is that if you use different labs for your soil tests, the Lyme recommendations that you can calculate from that might not be the same. So this first test that they came up with, the SMP stands for Shoemaker McLean Pratt Single Buffer. It's meant for soils with high Lyme requirements but low organic matter, and it's based out of Ohio soils. So what they would have done is taken all these soils and mixed them with this buffer and seen how much the pH changed over time and then created an equation to calculate how to do this for other soils. You can see the issue is it's meant for soils with high lime requirements, which means high CEC, but low organic matter. And that might not match all of our soils in Maryland. It can underestimate, if you have high organic matter, um, the amount of lime you need. Adams Evans, on the other hand, it's great for soils with low CEC and low organic matter. So University of Delaware uses it, and it makes sense if you have soils that are sandy and have low organic matter. This is a great test to find extremely small differences in pH and make adjustments. But it can overestimate what we call pH-dependent acidity, which depends on the aluminum content of your soil. Then there's the Malik single buffer. It's great for reducing exchangeable acidity, um, which is aluminum, at a pH of 5.5. It's great for soils with low EC, CEC, but it doesn't consider crop needs. And what I mean about that is this test right here is meant to get rid of aluminum. When you get your pH above 5.5, you don't have exchangeable aluminum in the soil that's toxic to your plant roots. But it doesn't consider your crop needs, like if your crop prefers a pH above 6 or not. So this test right here is great for getting rid of toxic effects, but it might not maximize production in all yields. Because every single one of these tests is going to have their own calibration. This would have been something Maryland would have used. You can see all these different textures down here in the left. Clays, silt loams, loams, sandy loams, and sands. If you have a clay soil, it requires more lime to increase the pH versus the sand, because the sand isn't well buffered. It doesn't have a lot of CEC. So Maryland, when they had their lab, they used texture in theirs. This would have been an SMP that Clemson uses, and you can see you have a soil buffer pH, and the pH you want to raise, uh, raise it to, and then how much lime you need to add. Here's one that, uh, from University of Delaware for Adams Evans, and they have a buffer pH and a water pH, and how you can match these up to add lime. And then this is a Malik from North Carolina. So it's important to understand and look on your soil test report to know which test was run and whether it matches your soils.
So this is an example of the Adams Evans that University of Delaware uses. And what's important about these tables as well is because it's so complicated how acidity comes off the soil and what forms it's in that they have to have tables for specific target pHs. And the target pH is the pH you want to raise your soil to. So if you want to raise your soil to a pH of 6.0, if your water pH is 5.9, that's your active acidity, that's what your crop sees. But what was in the buffer was only 7.9. If you started at 8, it only dropped to 7.9. That means you don't have a lot of acidity absorbed to the soil. Your water pH is 5.9. They don't recommend any longer. Versus the very far corner here, where they recommend up to 4 tons per acre, if your soil was very acidic and that pH in the buffer dropped to 7, meaning you also had a lot of reserve acidity, you need almost 4 tons of lime to raise that pH from 4.5 six. So these tables, you'll have to pay attention. If you want to look up a table yourself, and Delaware has all of these online for their tests, you want to make sure you get the right target pH. Because if you want to raise this pH to 6.5, you would need even more lime in this case. So you have your buffer pH and now what? You've gotten your test back and you've seen a buffer pH and they might have given you um, a calculation or a number so you can add the amount of lime that they recommend. But you want to look at your soil and decide if that's right for you, especially based on the test. So you might have a recommendation, recommend the crop type that you gave them. But the target pH you're trying to reach becomes very important, especially when looking at the soil type that you have. Because we don't need a pH of 7 for crops. Um, most people know this now, but it's always good to remind you. So a neutral pH, a pH of 7 means no acidity. So maybe 50, 60 years ago, we thought we'll tell people to push it to a pH of 7, and the crops will do great, and there'll be no acidity. But what we found was you could actually reduce yields when you went up to 7. But really, the main driver of toxicity in acidic soils is actually aluminum. And when your pH drops below 5.5, aluminum as a mineral starts to dissolve and it releases this free form of aluminum that's floating in the soil water and it's toxic to plant roots and kills them. The hydrogen, the acid itself, really isn't an issue until your pH drops below 4 and it's very rare, it should be, to have a soil that has a pH less than 4 that can grow anything at all. You also have to be concerned about these elements, manganese and iron. If there's a lot of them in your soil, they can be toxic at acidic pHs. But always remember that you don't need a pH of 7. You don't need a neutral pH. If you get above a pH of 5.5, then this aluminum is gone, and that's the main driver in the toxicity we see in acidic soils. The other thing to consider is, if your pH gets too high, you can lose access to micronutrients. So when your pH goes above 5.5, aluminum becomes a solid. But it's a metal. So are some micronutrients you need, like manganese and iron and they can become solids. Once something is solid, a plant root can't pull it up. So if you're not careful, if you push your pH to 7 in some cases, you might turn all of these nutrients into solids, not just the toxic aluminum, and then you'll end up seeing nutrient deficiencies in your crops. Another thing to keep in, matter, in mind is if you have a high organic matter soil, um, a soil that was in a floodplain maybe, or a swamp, the soil that's high in organic matter actually can remove organic matter, remove aluminum from the soil water so that it's not as toxic. So in North Carolina, they actually will recommend pHs as low as 5 in their highly organic soils um, out near the outer banks because they know the aluminum isn't going to be an issue. So target pH can be related to crop response. So you can see right here that Malik test that said we're going to get it to a pH of 5.5 five and not worry about aluminum. That's that red line right here. If you only pushed it to 5.5, you might miss the best ranges for these certain crops like corn, alfalfa, which likes an even higher pH because alfalfa makes its own nitrogen through um, a symbiotic relationship with bacteria. And that bacteria, the soil microbes, they like this pH of 6.5 to 7, which helps them produce nitrogen for alfalfa. And same thing with soybeans. Oats is one that can tolerate a much lower pH. 
But you can see if you stopped, if you said, well, if I get above 5.5 and, and I have more, no more aluminum toxicity, I'm good, but you might miss the best ranges for all these crops. So it's just one more thing to consider. You can also relate it to phosphorus availability. Now, some of the soils I deal with in Somerset County are pretty high in phosphorus. Phosphorus, so they shouldn't see an issue, but if you're in a part of the state with soil tests, you can actually maximize your phosphorus availability by putting it about a pH of six and a half. When you drop below six and a half, all those iron and aluminum that dissolve in the soil can actually create phosphates that plant roots can't pick up. When your pH goes above six and a half, a lot of the calcium in the soil can remove phosphorus. So a pH of six and a half is a way to maximize the phosphorus ability availability in your soil if it's pretty low. If you're if you're above um, 50 parts per million, it might not be as much of an issue. But like we said, you can also relate target pH back to micronutrients. You can find these tables all across the internet, all these figures. And they all look a little different, and some are in color and some aren't. Um, I typically steal this one because it has a reference on it, so I don't have to type it in. So you can see as you go across the top here, you have an acidic pH up to an alkaline pH of 8. And most of the time, we're going to recommend a pH to sit between 6 to 6.5. Now, the thicker all of these elements are means the more available it is. So right here, you can see aluminum. At five and a half, aluminum drops out, becomes a solid, and we don't have to worry about it. But quickly below there, you can see how high a concentration it gets and why it's toxic to plant roots. Same thing with iron. We need iron as a micronutrient, but when you drop too low, you get very high concentrations of iron. When you go too high, you don't have enough. Most of our major nutrients, like nitrogen, uh, potassium, magnesium, they aren't as affected by pH in the range that we usually sit. So you usually have enough of them. Same thing with sulfur, not really affected by pH a whole lot. It's our micronutrients that we can concerned with. So again, manganese, which can be toxic in this range, can quickly not have enough if you pushed your pH to about 7. Molybdenum is the only one that's opposite of all the other micronutrients. It actually increases in its concentration with higher pH. But you can see if you sit between six and six and a half, you have plenty right there. Manganese, iron, zinc, copper, and boron. As long as you're right in this range of six to six and a half, it's not too toxic and it's not too low. So micronutrient availability becomes another question you have to consider. If your soil has a low amount of these nutrients, you're not going to want to push your pH too high. So a sandy soil that doesn't have a high CEC and doesn't hold a lot of micronutrients, when you push a pH too high in those soils, you quickly lose access to them. So while we might tell you 6 to 6.5 six is great for crops, if you already know your soil is very low in micronutrients, you might not want to test that out and just get above 5.5 so you don't have aluminum. These are the kind of things you can think about as you're trying to raise your pH or thinking about raising your pH in your soil. What's your soil type? What are your micronutrient levels? What's your CEC? And what crop are you growing? All those questions, you can come up with an ideal pH. Predicting the availability of micronutrients is tough because it's not just pH that messes with them. Just like aluminum can be absorbed by organic matter, so can things like manganese. Uh, how wet your soil or oxidized is it can also affect manganese. So while pH is a simple way to look at it, in some soils you can reduce the availability of some of these nutrients by having too high organic matter or, um, or a certain, let's say, oxidation state in your soil. It's easy for us to figure out how to eliminate, eliminate aluminum toxicity. We know if you get above 5.5, aluminum's out of the soil. So that's the simplest way we can tell you. Get it above 5.5, five, you have no aluminum. Between 5.5 and, and 7, depending on your soil type, the organic matter content, the CEC, the, what the parent material of the soil weathered from, it's a lot harder to predict what nutrients and micronutrients are going to be available to your crop.
This is an example of manganese levels necessary at different pHs. This was a study done in South Carolina about 15 years ago. It would have been on a coastal plain soil, a sandy soil, for growing soybeans. And in the study they looked at how much manganese would we need to be able to extract from the soil, right here all these numbers, at certain soil pHs to be sufficient to grow soybeans. So at a pH of five and a half, he only needed three, three point four to up to four pounds per acre of manganese to grow soybeans sufficiently. By the time you get to a pH of seven, you need seventeen pounds. And what this is telling you is that the higher your pH is, you need more of the total nutrient just to make sure not all of it is a solid. So if you have a soil that's already low in this amount of manganese, and you raise that pH up to six, then you're already going to be lacking in that nutrient. And you might want to go out and either um, add it to the soil next year or do what they would call a foliar application of these soils. So University of Delaware, for a sandy soil, recommends a pH of about six, and for a clay soil, a pH of about six five. And you can see the difference. At a pH of six, you only need this much manganese in your soil, and in a sandy soil, you're not going to have a lot where you could push your pH to six and a half because you could um, you could have plenty of manganese in a clay soil and you can push that pH a little higher because you're more likely to have this amount in those soils. And again coming back to toxicity, the low pH causes toxicity. So if you try to lower your pH to make sure that you have enough manganese but you have other elements in your soil that are too high, and in some cases I've seen soil tests where people have added chicken litter and they had high zinc, or um, they've had high iron. For whatever reason, it was added to their soil at some point. If you're not aware of that, and you try to keep your pH low to make one micronutrient available, you might end up, in this case, if you have a soil like this, this red soil, when your pH drops below 5.5, you dissolve that iron oxide coating around the soil, and you release iron and aluminum into the soil, which can be toxic to your plant roots. So that's why we try to keep that pH up. Now this is only going to be important if you have a lot of this material in your soil. If you have a very sandy soil that's low in iron and aluminum, you might be able to push your pH a little lower to make micronutrients available and not have to worry as much about the toxic effects of aluminum. Again, the aluminum has to be there to be toxic. So if you have a very sandy soil that's not highly weathered, it might not be as much of an issue. So this is what Delaware would recommend for a sandy soil. A pH is 6.0, and you can see this example. That's a sand dune on the beach, so it's about extreme an example as I can get for soils. And um, low CEC, the thing about sandy soils is they have a low CEC and low nutrient holding capacity. So they're not going to hold a lot of nutrients, and they're not going to hold a lot of acids either. They also weather very slowly, so if within the sand anywhere you have micronutrients, they're not released very quickly. And then in general, these soils have low micronutrients. So we don't recommend a pH above 6.0. That doesn't mean that you go by this as a recommendation you do every single time. You can still look at your soil, and if you see a deficiency, you can be less than 6.0 as long as you say you stay above 5.5. For a clay soil, you could recommend a pH of 6.5 or possibly higher depending on what's the micronutrient content. It has a higher CEC, so if you were to add them to the soil, they're going to stick around. This material in this clay is already has a lot of surface area. It's going to weather faster, and if it has micronutrients in its structure, it's going to release them. And in general, these soils have greater micronutrients. But again, this is just a general recommendation. For a clay soil, 6.5 should be fine. But if your soil has lower amounts of micronutrients, you could possibly keep it a little less than 6.5. But you don't want to go down to 5.5 in a soil like this where you're sure to have plenty of iron and aluminum. Another issue we can have with soils is uh, soil tillage and mixing. This is a field from down here. It's a sandy soil. It's a flat landscape, and it's a no-till field. And the issue that we can have with tillage is when you lime a soil like this, and this is why we recommend that you add lime in the fall, because this lime, you want it to react with the soil and mix in.
So this lime was added. It sat on the surface of the soil. It was no till, so it wasn't mixed in. And the pH up at the surface was 7. When you go down to the subsurface, it can drop to 6.5 and 6.0. So an issue in a field like this, you could plant soybeans. And early on, you might see a deficiency. But if the roots get down deeper, they could pick up micronutrients. But if this whole range where the roots are ends up being a pH of 7, you can come up with a field like this. And this field across here, when we tested um, the plants, actually came up as having a manganese deficiency across the whole field because the pH was pushed too high. It was a sandy soil and didn't have a lot of manganese in the first place. And although this field had never shown a deficiency in the past 10 years, this liming that was done um, caused it. So in this case, I know they've gone back out in the field and they've, they've dissed it in and um, they've added in some nutrients to make sure they don't have the issue again. When we took samples of the soil, you can see that pH 7 and 6.9, much higher than we would recommend for a sandy soil, and definitely a cause of concern if you already have low micronutrients. So the soil and leaf tissue that we sampled for here were deficient in manganese, but what was also interesting is that the leaf tissue was also deficient in copper. The soil tests show that there was plenty of copper in this field when they extracted it. The problem was the pH was so high at 7 that there wasn't enough copper available that it was all a solid and the plant couldn't pick it up. So by testing these leaves we were actually able to see that the soil was deficient in manganese and the leaves were. Well that makes sense. But what's interesting is that the copper was also deficient in this plant while the soil was not. So that's why it's a good idea that if you do see a deficiency to make sure that you take a test of the soil and the leaves to see exactly what's going on and what the problem might be. A copper deficiency um, is pretty hard to find on the internet. It's, it's not seen very often. So you would definitely have to have the sandier soils we have, but you can see some of these lesions on the outside. This is the actual field that we sampled, and you can see a whole range of manganese deficiency going across these tissues. And the difficult part in figuring out what's going on in your field is, especially for the untrained eye, which I'm a soil scientist, so I will say I have an untrained eye, trying to tell the difference between is it a disease or is it a nutrient deficiency. And one of the first things you can see when you see these, what we call um, like a chlorosis, a yellowing on the leaf, if you see green veins, and you see yellowing of the leaves early on, and not just all these brown spots. That's a good um, idea that you might have a micronutrient deficiency and not a disease problem. But this is soybean leaves from the upper canopy. And you can see across these leaves a whole range, and this was across the whole field, from leaves that are just starting to get the manganese deficiency with a little bit of some of that copper that we saw in the brown spots, all the way up to leaves that were already necrotic. And um, in discussing nutrient deficiencies, one thing I probably should have put in here and to keep in mind is not all nutrients are mobile in the soil. And if you want to look up how to tell a different deficiency, it's good to understand that things like uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, how they would move to newer leaves and you might see deficiency in lower leaves versus nutrients that aren't mobile in plants. So a plant that can't move a nutrient across, the new leaves that are grown would show a deficiency. But if a nutrient can move through the tissue within the plant, you end up seeing a deficiency in the older leaves. So that's one way to tell what kind of deficiency is going on out there. But there should be examples on the internet for you to look up and, and tell between certain crops. So trying to determine if you have a Lyme issue all comes down to scouting your fields. You should scout your fields for disease. You should scout your fields for nutrient issues, If particularly if you've limed a field for the first time in a while. You want to go out there and take a look, take samples, send them to us in extension, um, send them to your crop consultants, and see if we can figure out exactly what's going on so this issue can be fixed. Because the problem with determining some of this stuff in the field and why you should take samples is if you were to go online and try to figure out some of these deficiencies, you'll see that something like manganese and iron sound and look almost exactly the same. When you look them up between all these different universities, they're going to tell you that intervenal chlorosis on upper leaves is shared between manganese and iron. Same thing with dark green veins. Brown necrosis when severe, which means dead brown leaves. And it occurs on high pH soil, so it's not very helpful 
This is University of Nebraska, a picture of manganese deficiency versus iron deficiency. Now it's pretty uncommon for us to have an iron deficiency in this region of the country. It is more likely out in the Midwest. So probably if you see these colors, if you see these veins, it's manganese. But it doesn't mean it's not iron in some cases. You should never discount it. And it's the reason you should take a sample. Because again, these are pictures from other universities. Everything on the left over here is manganese. Everything on the right is iron. And to an untrained eye, and it's particularly these between Virginia Tech and Pioneer, you can see how similar the traits look. And in this case, it's always a good idea just to spend the money, send off the tissue sample so you can see exactly what's the problem. So in summary, when evaluating the Lyme requirement, the whole purpose of this discussion is so that you understand what that buffer pH is on the test and you understand that you should question it. If you're given a recommendation, you can take it. You can do exactly what the lab test tells you, but be sure to scout your fields. Go out there and take a look and see, did this happen down here on the right? Did you end up over applying Lyme to a soil that couldn't handle it? Understand that all these lab tests are different. In this region, we have several labs to choose from. And if you have tests that are done in Ohio or Virginia or Delaware, if they don't use the same exact way to figure out buffer pH in the buffer capacity of your soil, they might not apply the same across your farm. Understand that your soils might be different, especially here on the eastern shore. We can go from sandy to clay soils pretty quick, but even in a clay soil, you might have a different parent material that isn't providing the same CEC or the same amount of micronutrients in your soil. So don't just assume across your entire farm that everything's the same and always scout your fields, particularly if you've limed them that year, to make sure you did not overlime them. Underliming a soil isn't quite as bad as overliming because dropping the pH back down might take an addition of a material like sulfur or just time to leach those bases back out. And that's also why we're going to recommend that you give lime plenty of time to react and why it's better to apply lime in the fall so it mixes with your soil profile, so it reacts with all the acidity because if it doesn't react completely with the acidity, that means you have a concentrated lime sitting at the surface that's maintaining a pH that could be 7 or higher, even though you added the perfect amount of lime to reduce the acidity in the upper 6 inches. If it doesn't mix within those 6 inches, then you don't end up reducing um, or raising your pH in the long run. All right, so I see uh, one question already up there. By a whole whole lot of organic matter in a soil like that, we're talking organic soils, Erica, which are going to be, um, in some cases, 20%. Talking like a swampy soil that probably, if you've been down that region in North Carolina, they have very large uh, drainage ditches and drain control structures, and they're highly organic soils. The Everglades would be another one. If you have above 10%, maybe you start seeing that issue, but it's pretty hard on our soils around here to get anything, unless you're on the western side of Maryland and you have clay, but on the um, the eastern shore of Maryland and the sandy soil, I don't think you'll see it quite as much. Thank you for watching our archived presentation of our Wednesday webinar. If you would like to see more archived Wednesday webinars, please visit our YouTube channel or to find a schedule of upcoming live webinars, visit our website.